Okay, in the first uh, lecture hour, we were um, looking at important aspects of uh, kingdom lifestyle. And what are some of the things we saw? Kingdom aspects of kingdom lifestyle? What are some of the uh, impo important aspects of kingdom lifestyle we looked at so far? Righteousness, peace, and joy. Okay, righteousness, power. peace, and joy. Okay. Power, power, authority, and dominion. Authority, power, and dominion. Yes. Endurance and suffering. Endurance and suffering. Holiness and reverence as well. Yes. Okay. Okay. Salvation. That is part of the this one. It's yeah. Okay. Thank you, Lucy. Uh, and thank you, in-person students. Okay, we'll continue. Another, uh, 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 we were looking at uh, another important aspect of kingdom lifestyle is, uh, we said, is in endurance and um, suffering. Okay, uh, so uh, let's read um, 2 Thessalonians chapter 1, verses 4 and 5, please. 2 Thessalonians 1, 4 and 5. Read, Nelson. You have the mic. Read it. One, four, and five. So that we ourselves boast of you among the churches of God for your patience and faith in all your persecutions and tribulations that you endure, which is manifest evidence of the righteous judgment of God, that you may be counted worthy of the kingdom of God for which you also suffer. Amen. So Paul is saying, thank you. Paul is saying here, I heard that you're going through really difficult things, but he's saying, hey, this is evidence that you have been called into the kingdom of God. And because you are part of the kingdom of God, therefore you're facing all these problems. So he's saying, go through it so that even your faith may be tested like fire. And when it's tested with fire, it's going to come out pure and refined like gold, okay? So when we go through troubles, hardships, and difficulties, we know that it's evident because we are part of the kingdom of God, and we go through it with that confidence and hope that God is with us, like we learned yesterday, that when Paul says, no one was with me, but only the Lord Jesus was with me, right? So he's with us, the Father, Son, and the Holy Spirit with us. The Trinity is with us. What more power we need? Who, who else do we need? What other presence than we need than the Father, Son, and the Holy Spirit? And he says, go through all of these so that you can be tested and you can come out as gold. That means pure, holy, refined, and, uh, you know, um, uh, as worth as gold. Okay, so this is part of kingdom lifestyle, which is endurance and suffering. Forgiveness is also another important aspect of kingdom living. Now, Jesus gave us many stories, many parables. Uh, and he said, when he started some of the parables and stories, he said, the kingdom of God, heaven is like, okay, and then he would reveal some aspect of the kingdom of God or the kingdom of heaven. So we look at one such uh, parable in Matthew chapter 18, verses 20 to 25. Any of our online students would like to read that? It's in Can your... Can I read, sister? Yes, yeah, sure. Go ahead. Yes. Matthew 18, 23 to 35. Therefore, the kingdom of heaven is like a certain king who wanted to settle accounts with his servants. And when he had begun... To settle accounts, one was brought to him who owed him 10,000 talents. But as he was not able to pay, his master commanded that he be sold with his wife and children and all that he had and that payment be made. The servant therefore fell down before him saying, Master, have patience with me and I will pay you all. Then the master of that servant was moved with compassion, released him and forgave him the debt. But that servant went out and found one of his fellow servants who owed him a hundred denarii, And he laid hands on him and took him by the throat saying, pay me what you owe. So, he, so his fellow servant fell down at his feet and begged him saying, have patience with me and I will pay you all. And he would not, but went and threw him into prison till he should pay the debt. 
So when his fellow servants saw what had been done, they were very grieved and came and told their master all that had been done. Then his master, after he had called him, said to him, You wicked servant, I forgave you all that debt because you begged me. Should you not also have had compassion on your fellow servant, just as I had pity on you? And, and his master was angry and delivered him to the torturers until he, pay, until he should pay all that was due to him. So my heavenly father also will do to you if each of you from his heart does not forgive his brother his trespasses. Amen. Thank you, Gertrude. So here we uh, see Jesus is talking about a parable. You know, he says stories that are connected to our world and we can understand. So, and he brings out kingdom principles or kingdom learnings. So he says, okay, this is how the kingdom of God is or the kingdom of heaven is through these parables. Okay. So here in this parable, who is the master? No, Jesus Christ. Yes, it's it's God, okay, Jesus Christ, God the Father, you know, uh, and who is the, the the servant? We. Yes, it's we. Yes, it's each one of us. And the fellow servants? Other people, okay, who are connected to us, to our lives, okay? So, um, the Father or God forgives us, but we people don't are not willing to forgive others when the father has forgiven us of such big grievous sins that we have done you know uh, we are not willing to forgive those who have you know done small things or even things that would have really hurt us very very deeply okay so jesus said jesus is saying this parable and he's saying this is how the kingdom of heaven is or this is how the kingdom of god is and so he's saying this is the principle so what is the principle it says in as much as god has forgiven us god expects also for us to forgive those who have offended us or those who have hurt us okay so god ex just like god extends his mercy and forgiveness you know he expects us to extend his mercy and forgiveness to those who have wronged us okay um, or those who have um, hurt us deeply and he's saying just like he has extended his unconditional forgiveness towards us his unconditional love towards us and he has freely extended his forgiveness towards us we are also required to do the same and that he's saying is kingdom lifestyle just like we have been extended unconditional forgiveness we also have to extend unconditional forgiveness to others just like god has freely forgiven us we also have to freely forgive others so i'm sure we have in our lives you know many of them that we have taken and locked up in the prison doors in our so-called prison doors right we have jailed some people who have hurt us who have wronged us you know, uh, I remember the, this, um, I went for a seminar and this, uh, uh, this, the speaker was saying, you know, uh, in our lives, we, many people have hurt us and wronged us. We have taken them and put in them, put them in the jail, in our prisons, in our lives, you know. And he says, in the prison, who is the only person who does not sleep? Jailer. Yes, the jailer is the only person who does not sleep. Why? He has to watch over the prisoners who are already in the within the prison bars and doors. So he's saying, you know, when you jail people in your life, you don't forgive them. You are the one who is not able to live in peace. You're not the one who's, you're the only one who's not able to rest in peace. Because so many people, you have jailed them, you're constantly watching them. You know, what is their next move? Or they'll run away or what? You know, so, you know, this morning, we can think of people we have put in prison doors, we have jailed, we have not extended our forgiveness. And just like God has forgiven us, let's take that step and ask God to help us to forgive them. Okay. Now, forgiveness does not alter the thing that has happened, but forgiveness releases us from having that kind of grudge towards that person. What has happened has 
happen. You can't reverse things. There's nothing that you can do. But there's something that you can do is don't hold that person as a prisoner anymore in your life. Okay, because you are the person that is going to feel all that pain and that hurt. And you are the one who's going to go through all that struggle okay so forgive and so jesus is saying that forgiveness is also part of the kingdom of god another important aspect or characteristic of kingdom living is stewardship and jesus says yet another story in a parable in matthew chapter 25 verses 14 to 30 so can somebody read that please shall i sister yes sure lucy you can go ahead Matthew 25, 14 to 30. For the kingdom of God is like a man traveling to a far country who called his own servants and delivered his goods to them. And to one he gave five talents, to another two, and to another one, to each according to his own ability, and immediately he went on a journey. Then he who had received the five talents went and traded with them and made another five talents. And likewise he who had received two gained two more also but who had received one went and dug in the ground and hid his lord's money money and after a long time the lord of those servants came and settled accounts with them so he who had received five talents came and brought five other talents saying lord you delivered to me five talents look i have gained five more talents besides them his Lord said to him, Well done, good and faithful servant. You were faithful over a few things. I will make you ruler over many things. Enter into the joy of your Lord. He also, who had received two talents, came and said, Lord, you delivered to me two talents. Look, I have gained two more talents besides them. His Lord said to him, Well done, good and faithful servant. You have been faithful over a few things. I will make you ruler over many things. Enter into the joy of your Lord. Then, is, then he who had received the one talent came and said, Lord, I knew you to be a hard man, reaping where you have not sown and gathering where you have not scattered seed. And I was afraid and went and hid your talent in the ground. Look, there you have what is yours. But his Lord answered and said to him, You, you wicked and lazy servant, you knew that I reap where I have not sown, and gather where I have not scattered seed. So you ought to have deposited my money with the bankers, and at my coming, I would have received back my own with interest. So take the talent from him and give it to him who has ten talents. For to everyone who has, more will be given, and he will have abundance. But from him who does not have, even what he has will be taken away and cast the unprofitable servant into the outer darkness. There will be weeping and gnashing of teeth. Amen. Thank you, Lucy. So Jesus is saying this is, uh, you know, how the kingdom of heaven is. In my kingdom, I expect people to be good stewards of what I have given to them. So note what something here, uh, very important here, something that we can note is, uh, you know, it's not how much God has given to us, okay? What is important is what you have done with what he has given you, okay? So some of us may have little, some of us may have little more, some of, some of us have may have a lot more. He's not going to ask us how much he gave us, but he's going to ask us what we did with what he has given us. Okay. So don't look at, okay, I have very little, so it doesn't matter. I'm not going to be, there's not going to be greater accountability. Or some of you might be saying, hey, I have a little more, you know, it's okay. The accountability is not so great. It's not about that. Okay. It's about, you know, he's going to ask us what he, we did with what he has given us whether he's given us one or two or five he's going to ask us what he we did with what he has given us did we double it did we multiply it uh, were we good stewards of what he has given us so some of us think that you know hey god is not a businessman i didn't know god was a businessman you know i didn't know god was a man uh, was somebody who would look for profit 
Uh, he would look for us to do business with what he has given us, engage in business. No, he is a God who looks for fruits. He is a God who looks for multiplication. Okay, And he looks for us to be good stewards of what he has given to us. So what has God given to us? Talents. What else? Gifts, holy, uh, gifts of the Holy Spirit. Okay, he's given us gifts. He's given us talents. What else he's given us? Salvation, yes. Grace, okay. Huh? Mercy. He's given us time, money, opportunities. Okay, he's given you opportunity to study in a Bible college. So he's going to ask you what you have done with it right so he's given us time money opportunities given us contacts people that we can engage with with who we can be salt and light to he's given us talents and abilities he's given us a revelation from his word okay and he's given us a whole lot of things like you have mentioned but with everything that he has given us he's expecting us to be a good steward a good steward doesn't mean hey i come to bible college i went through the timetable, the schedule. I was very faithful. I attended all the classes, but don't ask me what was taught. Don't ask me what I learned. I attended the classes. I attended everything. I was very faithful. See, but what is God asking you is you have got the opportunity to learn these immense revelations. What have you done with it? Did you take time to study it? Did you take time to learn it? Did you take time to reflect on it, to make it part of your life? And also, are you ready in a position to take it out and to minister to others? So that is what he's looking for as stewards of all of you who are in Bible college. Okay, so all of us, he is looking for us to be steward of what he has given to us. And that is part of kingdom lifestyle. So what are we doing with our time? God is saying, hey, I brought you to Bible college. What are you doing with your time? You know, are you just attending classes and then taking part in all the activities? That's not what he's really looking. Bible college is a place where we, um, we equip ourselves with the word of God and with the revelation. Are you taking time to read? Are you taking time to understand, to go through the notes, to learn for yourself and to, uh, you know, uh, grasp all these truths so that you can... Uh, use it later on. What are you doing with your contacts? What are you doing with the opportunities that God is giving and is coming your way? What are you doing with your talents and your abilities? Are you being good stewards of it? So that is what he's going to ask each one of us. Okay. Another characteristic of kingdom lifestyle is there is no partiality. Okay. Yes, Sister Gertrude. Sister, I just want to say that, you know, I have started a Bible study for my own family who don't understand the Bible uh, every Sunday, once a week. Whatever I am learning from the Bible study, I am sharing with them. Great. Thank you. That's uh, so encouraging. Thank you so much for sharing. Yes, you, uh, we'll move. Uh, yeah, we'll move on. Another characteristic of kingdom lifestyle is no partiality. So can somebody please read James chapter 2 verses 1 to 5, please? James chapter 2 verse 1 to 5. My brethren, do not hold the faith of our Lord Jesus Christ, the Lord of glory, with partiality. For if there should come into your assembly a man with gold rings in fine apparel, and there should also come in a poor man in filthy clothes. And you pay attention to the one wearing the fine clothes. And say to him, you sit here in a good place. And say to the poor man, you stand there. Or sit here at my footstool. Have you not shown partiality among yourselves? And become judges with evil thoughts? Listen, my beloved brethren. Has God not chosen the poor of this world to be rich in faith and heirs of the kingdom which he promised to those who love him? Amen. Thank you. So here, uh, James, inspired by the Holy Spirit, is saying that in the kingdom of God, we have to treat everybody equally. 
okay, whether they're rich, they're poor, educated, uneducated, whether they have a high standing in society, low standing in society, simple person, ordinary person, regardless of who they are, you know, they are all of us are heirs of the kingdom of God. All of us are children of the kingdom of God, and hence we don't do anything out of partiality and that is kingdom lifestyle even partiality doesn't mean that we treat people from our own people group our language our tribe our uh, uh, people from the places we come from with partiality but we treat everyone equally okay so we need to live like that we need to reach out to people who are educated uneducated people who are poor who are rich okay uh, people of all ages we need to reach out to them in the kingdom of god okay so Yes, the Bible does teach us that we give honor to those who honor is due, which means we hold in high regard those who serve the Lord, who labor in the word, who have spiritual oversight over our lives. We read this in 1 Thessalonians chapter 5, verses 12 and 13. Yes, we give them, you know, high regard. Paul says, give double honor to those who preach and teach. Yes, we do that. And who those who have spiritual oversight. But yet, in the way we do things, we do not show partiality or we don't show preferential treatment uh, based on earthly criteria like wealth, social standing, or even gender. So another characteristic of kingdom living is there is no partiality. Okay. We'll move on. Another characteristic we see is readiness for the king. So we'll uh, look at another parable uh, in Matthew chapter 25, verses 1 to 13. So can somebody read that, please? Matthew chapter 25, 1 to 13. Then the kingdom of heaven shall be likened to ten virgins who took their lamps and went out to meet the bridegroom. Now five of them were wise and five were foolish. Those who were foolish took their lamps and took no oil with them. But the wise took oil in their vessels with their lamps. But uh, while the bridegroom was delayed, they all slumbered and slept. And at midnight a cry was heard. Behold, the bridegroom is coming. Go out to meet him. Then all those virgins arose and tongue uh, trimmed their lamps trimmed their lamps and the foolish said to the wise give us some of your oil for our lamps are going out but the wise answered saying no lest there should not be enough for us and you but go rather to those who sell and buy for yourselves and while they went to buy the bridegroom came and those who were ready went in with him to the wedding and the door was shut. Afterward, the other virgin came also, saying, Lord, Lord, open to us. But he answered and said, Assuredly, I say to you, I don't know you. Watch therefore, for you know neither the day nor the hour in which the Son of Man is coming. Amen. Thank you. So the Lord Jesus, uh, you know, he said this parable. And in this parable, he said, the kingdom of heaven is you know is like um, um, likened to ten virgins. So he's basically teaching us how to live in a constant state of readiness. How to be constantly ready for the coming of the king. So one way of applying this parable is to understand that our lives and the works that we do are lamps that are giving out light okay there are different ways we can read this parable in different contexts but in the context that we are looking at it one way of applying this parable is to understand that our lives and our works are lamps that are giving out light okay and jesus said our lives who we are who are we we are the light of the world matthew chapter 5 verse 14. so he says who we are we are the light of the world and our good works, that means our ministry or the things we do in his name or the things that we do for his sake or our kingdom assignment is the way people see his light shining before them. And when they see the light shining before them, what do they do? They glorify the Father who is in 
heaven. So our works, our ministry, the kingdom assignment, everything that we do for God's sake is people seeing his light shining before them and they are able to glorify the Father. Because when Jesus came, he was the light. When, he did, when people saw the miracles and the works that he did, what did they do? Who did they glorify? Yes, they glorified God the Father who is in heaven. Okay, So we must ensure that our lives are constantly radiating light and that light continually until Jesus comes. So our lives are light and we must ensure that our lives are continuously radiating the light of Jesus. Now to make this happen, we need an ongoing supply of oil, right? If we need our lamps burning, we need an ongoing supply of oil, okay? So what is the oil? The oil basically is the, the presence, the life, and the anointing of the working of the Holy Spirit. So the oil here is signifying, or the Bible signifies the life, the presence, the anointing, and the working of the Holy Spirit, without which we ourselves cannot do any good works, or whatever we do is lifeless, is good for nothing. So we need to ensure that through each passing day, that there's a continual supply of oil in our lives so that we can be that light. So what will give us this continued supply of oil in our lives so that we can be the light? What does the Bible say? How can we continually have the life, the presence, anointing? Yes, Having we need to abide with... in him. Sorry, Lucy. Having fellowship with God. Yes, we need to abide with Him. We have to remain with Him. We have to be connected with Him. We need to be having fellowship with Him. Fellowship through prayer, worship, reading God's Word, obedience, and all that comes through our intimacy with God. Okay? So kingdom living calls for a lifestyle of constant intimacy with God where we keep our lives, and, uh, uh, or we keep our lights uh, shining continually till He comes. Amen. So we looked at this parable in the context of kingdom of God and in the context of Jesus's coming again. Okay. The last thing is about uh, being a celibate for the kingdom or kingdom's sake. So can somebody please read Matthew 19, 9 to 12, please. Matthew 19 was 9 to 12. And I say to you, whoever divorces his wife, except for sexual immorality and marries another commits adultery. And whoever marries her who is divorced commits adultery. The disciples said to him, If such is the case of the man with his wife, it is better not to marry. But he said to them, All cannot accept this saying, but only those to whom it has been given. For there are innants who were born thus from their mother's home, and there are innants who were made innants by men, and there are innants who have made themselves innants for the kingdom of heaven's sake. He who is able to accept it, let him accept it. Amen. Thank you. So the term eunuch here is used in the context of being single, being celibate, not married. Okay. And it's not in the context of going uh, or undergoing a change as is commonly understood in our day and time. Okay. So he says, yes, there are people who are born to be single. Uh, with no inclination, with no desire, with no uh, tendency to be married. And there are those who want to be married, okay? So it doesn't matter. The, those of them who are celibate, it can be their own desire or it can also be because of some social, religious or other influences that has compelled them to not marry and to be single or celibate, okay? Then the, there are those who choose a celibate lifestyle for the sake of the kingdom. I think like Paul. I think, uh, Nelson, you asked this question yesterday. Was Paul married or not? Paul was celibate. So maybe he chose to be celibate for the kingdom of God. So there are many people who who choose to not marry because they want to be, you know, do great things for the kingdom of God. So we see Apostle Paul is one of the examples in this category, okay? So Paul knew that he had the right to take a 
believing wife, but he chose to forego this right for the sake of preaching the gospel so that he could, you know, bring many into the kingdom. Okay. So this is also something that is kingdom lifestyle, which many people cho choose to do. So we saw many uh, different uh, characteristics of kingdom lifestyle. We saw many important characteristics that is required of us as kingdom lifestyle. So I would like you to take some time, you know, during the study time today to read, to see where the areas you are lacking and to pray and to ask God to help you. Okay. Before we move on to the next chapter, anyone has any questions? Chapter six, kingdom culture. Anyone has any questions? Online students, you all are very quiet, excepting uh, uh, only Lucy and Gertrude. I hear, get to hear their voices. What about the others? All of you are able to follow? Yes, no? Can you have some responses from the online students? All of you there? These Thank you, Andrew. Yeah. These characteristics, characteristics of this kingdom lifestyle, uh, are these something that we all uh, develop on a gradual level or is it something that, you know, together it has to be inculcated and, uh, you know, put together? How, how is it in our work with the Lord? Oh, is it uh, is this something that is a gradual process where you grow? Yes, you grow in different levels, you know, um, uh, but yeah, there are some things that you lack as well. So these are simple pointers and reminders uh, to us. So even when I prepare these notes every time and I'm studying, I it, it kind of, I am learning and I am also correcting myself and seeing areas. So we all need that, right? Um, so it's good to the sun, but these are like righteousness, peace and joy, you know, it's characteristic of the kingdom, endurance, perseverance, uh, holiness, reverence. I think all this comes as part is the fruit that we bear when we are abiding in the wine. It's the life of the wine, the life of God that flows through us and that causes us to live this kingdom uh, lifestyle. Okay, yes. Um, how can we know we are abide with God? Because so many things when happens like uh, we sometimes we angry, we go through the emotions so many things people around us so how we can abide like how can we know we are abiding in god and what helps us for that okay so how do we ab know that we're abiding in christ uh, even when we go through challenges and difficulties that's what you're asking so yes when we go through challenge and difficulties it's important in those seasons also those times to spend time praying and reading the word because it's at those times the word of God really corrects us, encourages us, strengthens us, builds us up. And then when we are praying, the Holy Spirit reminds us of everything that we have learned, you know, our attitude, what it should be, uh, how we should respond, how we should live, how we should go further with these things. So yes, abiding in those in the vine and those times or abiding in God at those times is very, very important because we get the life of God. We receive the strength of God. We receive the wisdom, the counsel, the knowledge, the understanding to help us go through those uh, seasons and those challenges and uh, difficulties. And how do you know you are abiding in the vine Be uh, or you are abiding in God? Is that when you receive an answer for or God is correcting you, or God is teaching you, or God is rebuking you, or God is giving you an encourage, word of encouragement, a strategy, what to do. You say, hey, this is from God. You know, God has helped me. God has enabled me. God has corrected me. So then you know, yes, I am abiding in God. I am intimate with God, or I'm walking with God. And that is why I'm willing, I'm hearing from him, and I'm willing to hear and respond and be obedient to what he's telling me to do. So Lucy says, uh, always being conscious and implementing practically, it's so difficult, it is convicting us when we interact and respond to people, it's helping me to 
the new in mind. Okay, so she's just basically saying that whatever she's learning is helping her to um, be conscious, implement things. It's also convicting her, and it's helping her to uh, you know live kingdom thinking, kingdom lifestyle, kingdom culture when she's interacting, responding to people, and helping uh, to have a renewed mind. Yes, thank you, Lucy. Yeah. Anyone else has any questions? Anything you'd like to say before we move to kingdom culture? Okay, we'll move on to chapter um, six, Kingdom Culture. Okay, page number 65. Okay, now we looked at a few aspects of kingdom thinking and we talked about kingdom living. Now, if we have to put both of these together, if you have to put kingdom thinking and kingdom living together, you know, is what we call as kingdom culture. Okay, so what is kingdom culture? Kingdom thinking and kingdom living when you put them together it's called kingdom culture okay so all of us begin to walk and think and behave according to the kingdom of god according to what uh, you know god has taught us in his word uh, and what it requires us to be as part of the kingdom of god when we do that when we walk think behave live uh, according to the kingdom of god we are creating something called the kingdom culture okay and that is what we want our churches that is what we want our whole house churches that is what we want our families our extended families that is what we want in our bible college that we want a kingdom culture where everybody is thinking the kingdom of god everybody is living the kingdom of god and we are a community of people who are experiencing the kingdom culture yes sir get through Sister, I have uh, a question. Why don't they preach about this kingdom of God nowadays in the churches and in the sermons? Good question. Why don't they preach about the kingdom of God in the churches today and in the sermons? Can anyone tell me? They do? I've seen our pastor do, but uh, in your churches they do? Good, that's nice to hear. Yes. No, sister, in CSI we have not about not heard about it. <laughs> <laughs> Since they have specific topic for each Sunday, which is yes. decided by the bishop and the authorities. Yes. So you need to pray for the CSI churches that the kingdom <laughs> of God, <laughs> the kingdom of God will rise up in its place, in its authority and its power, and people will see the importance of the kingdom of God. Yes. And also worshiping God in different postures. It is not been encouraged. It's encouraged, but people shy off from that. Yes. So I think you all are learning. You all can start teaching the kingdom of God. Some of our Bible college students here, in-person students, they are saying that uh, they have heard uh, the, the sermon series on kingdom of God being preached in their churches, which is very, very encouraging. But many people think that, you know, they don't even think about the kingdom of God. It's not something that is, you know, it's something that... Uh, uh, is not very relevant to them, something also that is not, they see is not very important, that doesn't come to their minds or they're ignorant. And so I think we need to educate people. Uh, we also need to, um, you know, we can also learn from it. Yeah. So from the Bible college I came from, there was uh, kingdom of God was there, but not in such depth. So when I uh, read this book and I prepared for these classes, it brought a whole new wealth of revelation. So, you know, you are also receiving that and you can also use it and share the, this, these books with others. Uh, share it with your family members, teach it to them and they can be helped. Yes. Anyone else would like to add if I said something? Anyone Thank else? Thank you, would sister. Say? Yeah, anyone else would like to add to get Ruth's question? Online students, you're from different churches, different experiences. Please share. Where's the mic? Where's the mic? Hmm. 
Uh, since uh, there are quite a few parables where Jesus emphasized about kingdom of God is like kingdom of God is like thing, so I'm sure most churches do cover uh, that in the form of a parable or thing. May not be in a specific series for the entire month, but uh, I don't kind of sense. Ah, uh, they use the parables out. in one-off yes. things, but they don't teach it specifically as a, as a kingdom of God, of thing, as a series yes, of the sure kingdom of God. Been covered, kind yeah. Of. But we, that's what she's saying. Is the series about the kingdom of God being preached? Asapu is being preached, kingdom of God, as a series? Not like a series. Then you said yes. Like a one-off sermon. Uh, one-off sermon I've also heard, but not like a series. So I don't think people see the importance of the kingdom of God. They didn't, don't see that, you know, what Jesus preached was... The kingdom of God, even when he, you know, he went up to heaven, ascended to heaven. Before that, he spoke about the kingdom of God. Even when Paul, we read yesterday so many verses, even he was ministering, he spoke about the kingdom of God. So I think people are not, you know, they're looking more for prosperity gospel, comfortable gospel, healing gospel, uh, encouraging gospel. <laughs> No, not about, uh, you know, kingdom of God and lifestyle and culture and thinking that needs to be changed. So I think we can bring that about. Yes, Miriam. Um, surely in churches these days, they don't uh, preach series. Let me say people have left the word of God. Uh, just like you said, people now are focusing in... Uh, preaching prosperity, things that make man happy. They have left to preach the word of God. You find even sometimes somebody comes or maybe a man of God, most of them even prepare their sermons in the pulpit. So really, you find those who are just coming in, they're not getting anything in the kingdom of God. And if you try to ask this, oh God, they will just bring you down and sit you and ask you a lot of questions. What do you know about this? What do you know about this? So we really need wisdom on that. Yes, we need wisdom. And uh, we can also pray, like we said, you know, we have the kingdom of God is in us. We have kingdom authority. We have kingdom power. Uh, we have kingdom dominion to influence even our church, churches that are dead, churches that are lifeless, churches that are, have a form of godliness but denying its power. Uh, you know, God, you are hearing these things and so you, God is going to raise you up. God is going to strengthen you and you can begin teaching these things in your church and you can just pray for a move of God, for opportunities that God can open. And when God sees you as a good steward, he will open more opportunities and you can preach and teach. Yes. Thank you for sharing, Miriam. Yes. So I think all of you are going to rise up as kingdom builders to preach about the kingdom of God series. And so anyone inviting you, just preach about the kingdom of God. Yes. What will be the consequences if we don't preach much about kingdom of God in the churches or in the life of believers? What will be the consequences? You're already seeing the consequences. What are the consequences? A dead church, no life, no power of God being manifested, no people not experiencing the power of God. You know? The kingdom of God will be there. He will work. He will move. There are people, people manifesting. Like I said, this church, which I see, it's in the, the church in this world. Wherever they go, market, mall, anywhere, they carry the kingdom of God, you know, and their presence is mightily moving. So God is raising up churches. So, but he wants us to be those catalysts. He wants you and me to be those catalysts, those salt and light, to take it to our churches and teach and preach. Yes. So, like, we have to take as a balance all the sermons which we preach in the church, like about kingdom of God, about... Uh, yes, it's important to see what, I think as pastors, it's important to see what Jesus spoke, what he preached, and then, you know, bring out those as sermon uh, series. And also pray and ask the Holy Spirit what 
the church is going through, the season the church is going through, what are the sermons that are needed, and also take them through Old Testament, New Testament, different books of the Bible, teach on different aspects, family, marriage, all of these things should be covered during the year. So the pastor should plan that whole year. It's not like come up every week and think, okay, what, tomorrow I have to preach this, I'll just preach some sermon, yeah, off the net. But in most churches, uh, the liturgy or the series is planned way before and so like each month it's like planned much beforehand so it's not yes. like uh, so we need to pray for those who plan the liturgy uh, there will be a revival there god will move god will speak god will use you to encounter people who plan liturgies who plan sermon series especially in the the mainline churches that you can be an influence in their lives you never know you pray that god will use you right god will open doors yeah okay Thank you. We'll move on. Okay. Uh, we just have five more minutes. So we're looking at kingdom culture. Okay. Um, as believers, we are all being washed by the blood of Jesus Christ. Look at what Revelation chapter 1 verses 5 and 6 says. Please, can somebody read that? Revelation chapter 1 verses 5 and 6. It says, he has made us kings and priests to our god okay so here we see that god has already made us whom who has god already made us kings and priests to our god okay so he has already made us whom kings, kings and priests Priest. okay it's not a future reality it's a present reality so who are each one of us kings, kings and priests to our God, okay? So in the present, how are we kings and priests to our God? How are we priests and king to our God? How are we kings? Yes, we are in his image. As a king, we represent God who is our ruler and the one who reigns here on the earth. As kings, we are uh, resembling the king of this kingdom and we are here to see his kingdom come in and his will be done in the earthly realm okay and as priests how are we as priests huh okay as priests what are we sister we are intercessors intercessors okay what else as priests we are to glorify god in worship we are people who are able to stand, like Gertrude says, you know, intercede on behalf of people, take the matters of earth to heaven, see God's heart, see God's heavenly intervention in the affairs of the life of people. So, like Gertrude had posed a question, and Miriam said, and Lucy, and all of you shared. So, here is the answer, right? All of you are priests. So, you stand and intercede in the gap for pastors, people in authority, people in positions of leadership in our churches so that they will rise up to know their kingdom calling and what they have to preach and what they have to teach. Amen? Okay? So we will intervene, okay, of the affairs of this life to our king who is in heaven. Okay? And there's also a future tense application. That is a present tense, what we are saying. There's also future ten application. You know, we will also be kings and priests when we, when God comes and reigns in his literal kingdom. Okay? The thousand-year kingdom rule. When he reigns, we will also be kings and priests. We will be the royal priesthood. We will be a kingly priest. We will be kings and priests who are of this holy nation, like Peter says in 1 Peter chapter 2, verse 9. Okay, now when we talk about royal priesthood, holy nation, the word nation here in the Greek means ethnos. It can mean any race or it can mean any tribe or it can be any people with specific uh, customs or with specific culture. Okay, so as kings and priests, we are people of a common kingdom culture. 
okay so because we have a common kingdom culture that means we have a set pattern of attitudes values goals practices that characterize the kingdom okay and we also share common beliefs and behaviors we also share common uh, ethics and principles but as people belonging to the kingdom of God, we have a common culture. What is our common culture? Common attitudes, lifestyles, goals, values, practices, beliefs, behaviors, and also ethics and principles that we follow in the kingdom of God. So as believers, we follow kingdom thinking and kingdom living. And when we follow kingdom thinking and kingdom living, we can bring about kingdom culture. Okay, so why don't we see kingdom culture in our world today or in our churches? Because we are not following kingdom thinking and kingdom living, and because we are not following what Jesus taught in his gospels. Okay, we'll stop here. Any questions? Anything anyone else to say? Any questions? Anything anyone has to say? Okay, if not, um, we'll end class. Thank you all for listening patiently and hope we'll all put into practice what we are learning. Um, thank you and have a blessed day ahead. God bless. Thank you.